Hi, my name's Paul Grogan, and in this Gaming Rules video, I'm going to be teaching you how to play Railroad Revolution, published in 2016 by Watch Your Game. The game is set in 19th century America, and you're running a small railroad company on the East Coast. During the game, you'll expand your rail network, build train stations, and contribute to the development of the telegraph network. All the time competing with other railroad companies who are trying to do the same. The railroad revolution has begun. Each player takes a player board in their chosen colour. Fill all the spaces at the top of your board with houses and rails in your colour. You should have two rails and one house left over. Of these, place one of the rails in the starting rail space between Washington and Charlotte. The other rail and house will need later on. You also start the game with $600. Now, don't spend it all at once. Put the rest of the money next to the game board in a common supply. You also begin the game with three shares of the Western Union, the big telegraph company. During the game you can get extra shares from the Western Union by giving it access to your railroad telegraph services and building telegraph offices. Notice that the shares have $150 printed on them. That means at any time during the game you can sell one of them for $150. However, shares are useful things to hold on to, which will become clear later on. Put the rest of the shares into a common supply. Your company starts with a team of four unskilled workers. During the game you'll be able to hire additional ones with specific skill sets. Each turn you'll use one of your workers to perform one of the four actions on your player board, and the colour of the worker you use determines the cost and effectiveness of the action. Place all remaining workers in a common supply near the game board. No game with railroad in the title would be complete without some trains, and this game there are five different ones. Turn them all face up and divide them by type. Then take the ones with this icon and give one to each player, who places it face up next to their player board. If playing with fewer than four players, remove all other trains of that type to the box. From the other trains, use only one more per stack than the number of players in the game. So for a three player game, each stack should contain four trains. Sort the milestone tiles into groups by the letters and numbers on the backs. Shuffle each group separately and form five face down stacks. Deal one A1 milestone and one A2 milestone to each player, returning any leftovers to the box. Place your milestones face up in front of you. These starting milestones will give you objectives to aim for and will earn you points at the end of the game if you successfully complete them. Place one performance marker of each player on the bottom slot of each of the performance tracks. During the game these markers will go up the tracks, providing extra points at the end of the game. Shuffle the deal tiles and place them in a face down stack in the bottom right of the game board. Turn the top tile face up. This tile represents an entrepreneur offering their services in exchange for shares of the Western Union. At some point during the game this deal will be triggered, allowing all players to use their shares to gain the bonuses printed on the tile. This is the main use for shares. Take the city tiles and divide them into four groups based on the numbers on the backs. Then, on each city on the game board, place one city tile face up on the corresponding number. When playing with fewer than four players, some of the cities already have stations built in them. For a three player game, we start with a station of a non player colour in San Francisco, Bismarck, and Houston. Place the houses in the printed slot on the board. This is known as the first station slot. The bottom of the game board shows the telegraph network. Shuffle the telegraph tiles and place one face up in each section that does not have a deal icon on it. Like the cities, if you're playing with fewer than four players, some of these sections start with a house from the colour not in use. In a three player game, we have one here and here. There are four setup tiles, each side depicting a different bonus. From them, randomly choose one for each player in the game and place the chosen ones with a random side up in a display, returning any leftovers to the box. Take one worker of each of the colours, not including white, and place one randomly next to each of the tiles. Any workers left over are placed back in the common supply. Before the game actually starts, each player will receive one of these tiles and the corresponding worker. This means that your company structure at the start of the game will be different from the other players. Choose a start player at random and give them the first player tile. Then, in reverse player order, each player takes one of these tiles and the associated worker which is placed in their worker pool with the other four white ones. Each player then gets the bonus printed on the setup tile they took. Some of these bonus tiles show placing a rail or station on the board, and if you take one of these, the rail or station that you place is from the ones set aside earlier during setup, not from the ones on your player board. 
And now you're ready to start. Railroad Revolution is played with players taking turns in clockwise order until the end of the game is triggered. On your turn you perform one of four possible actions by placing a worker from your supply on an action area of your player board. The four actions are building stations, railroads and telegraph offices, as well as selling off one of your company's assets. Every time you take an action, the main part of the action, shown here, is performed completely, but the cost and effectiveness of the action depends on the colour of the worker you use. The action may become cheaper or better, I'll explain this more later on. You can repeat the same action multiple times on consecutive turns if you want to. There's no limit to the number of workers of any colour you can have on a single action space. Of course, you'll eventually run out of workers, so if you have no more workers in your supply at the very start of your turn, then and only then you take all workers from your player board back to your supply and then take an action as normal. Thus, choosing the correct worker for an action and the order in which you do so is a very important decision and one which you'll have to make on every turn of the game. Once one player has removed all rails and buildings to the left of their company logo, the game draws to a close and the value of each company is calculated by adding up the victory points on the scorepad. And the player with the most points wins the game. In Railroad Revolution there are many ways to score victory points. First you have these milestone tiles. These are like your own company's objectives, requiring you to construct railways and build stations in certain places. To complete these milestones you'll also have to remove some of your workers from your active pool, promoting them to managerial positions. If you complete a milestone during the game it will be worth the points shown on the tile. You flip it face down and then you get a new milestone. Next there are these three performance tracks. You can advance your markers up these tracks which will give you a points multiplier for a specific thing depending on the track. This one gives you points for each of your telegraph offices, this one for each of your stations, and this one for each west coast city that you've connected with your rail network. The performance tracks allow you to focus on specific areas of the game and work towards them while you play. Additional points are also gained by creating a connected telegraph network. By building telegraph offices in two adjacent sections will get you the points shown on the column between those sections. And finally any face up train tiles you have at the end of the game are also worth 8 points. As mentioned earlier, on your turn you will perform one of the four main actions by placing one of your workers onto the action space. This action is building a station in one of the cities, this one is extending your rail network, this action is building a telegraph office, and this one is selling off one of your pieces to raise money. No matter what colour worker you use, you must perform the main action in full, but then depending on the colour there's an additional effect shown below. These additional effects are always optional, but before I go any further, there's one very important rule that I need to explain. You can always use any of the workers as if it was one of the white non-specialised ones. So if you really wanted to build a station and use this additional effect, but you only had an orange worker left, then you still could, by using the orange worker as if it was white. There are some general rules that I'd like to explain before we delve into the actions in more detail. First, when you're resolving the effects of an action you can do so in any order, including paying for the action itself. I'll explain this more later on. Also, you must always have at least four workers in total at the end of a turn, split between your player board and your personal supply. You see, there are many ways in the game where you can actually get rid of your workers, but if you want to do this you have to make sure that you have at least four of them at the end of your turn. And finally, at any point during the game you can hire any one worker from the common supply for $800. Now there are much cheaper ways to get workers during the game, but if you want a specific one at a specific time then don't forget about this option because it could be just what you need. Before I jump into describing the different actions I'm going to go into a bit more detail about your company milestones because these will probably influence the choices that you make. You start the game with two milestones, one from the A1 deck and one from the A2 deck. To complete a milestone you need to fulfil two things, the conditions shown here and you need to have promoted a worker into a manager as shown here. The conditions are fairly easy to explain, this one requires you to have built rails connecting to two different level 2 cities, for example like this, I have connected Chicago and Little Rock, and to have built a station in a level 2 city, 
for example here. This one requires you to have built two rails in spaces with the brown triangle icon, such as this one. Promoting a worker basically means moving him from your player board or your personal supply and placing him onto the milestone. The icon on the milestone shows which type of worker you need to promote. Once a worker has been promoted into a manager, they are effectively gone. They cannot be removed from the milestone until it is complete. Remember that you must always have at least four workers in your pool at the end of a turn. And when you promote a worker into a manager, they're no longer available to you. So if you're going to be doing lots of promoting into managers, you're going to have to increase the size of your workforce by getting additional workers. You can place a manager on the tile before you fulfill the conditions of it. It's only when you've met all the requirements of a milestone that it's complete. At the end of any player's turn, if you have a completed milestone, remove the manager on it back to the common supply, and the milestone will be worth points to you at the end of the game. You flip it face down. Then you get to take a new milestone. Draw three tiles from the next deck, choose one of them, and return the others to the bottom. So when you complete one of your A milestones, you get to take a new milestone from the B deck. And when you complete a B milestone, you get to take one from the C deck, and so on. When you complete a D milestone, you don't get to take a replacement, because there is no E deck. In theory, you could complete eight milestones in total during the game, but this is unlikely to happen. Notice that the later milestones require two managers and are worth more points. And also notice that the D milestones can have managers of any colour, including white. Completing milestones can gain you a lot of points during the game, so it is something that you probably want to consider. Also, your starting milestones might give you some indication of the actions that you want to take at the start of the game. When you choose the build station action, take the leftmost building from your player board and place it onto an available city of your choice. Taking the leftmost piece from your player board is actually a general rule in the game. Whenever you take a building or a rail from your player board, it always has to be the leftmost available one. Why is this? Well, it will become clear later on when I talk about the trade action. An available city is one which you have reached with your rail network, so at the start of the game this can only be Washington or Charlotte. You must pay the cost shown above the city to build a station there. Now remember earlier when I explained that you can resolve the effects of an action in any order, well this includes actually paying for the station itself. For example, you wanted to build a station in Charlotte, but doing so would cost you $500, and you don't have $500. However, the bonus for building the first station here is that you get two shares. Now you can take those two shares first, and then sell them immediately for $150 each, giving you enough money to now pay for the station. The reward for building a station is shown on the right of the city tile, and if there's a slash, it means you can take either of those workers. Washington and Charlotte, for example, give you the choice between two colours of workers, while cities further in the west offer different, even greater rewards. Also, if you're the first player to build a station in a city, you place your building on the first station slot, and you get the bonus shown on the left side of the tile as well. Any other stations built are placed just to the right of the first station slot. Each city can have exactly one station of each player, so you cannot build in the same city twice. So why would you want to build stations? Well, building stations is a good way of getting additional workers, and you are going to need more workers as the game goes on. Your choice of where you build a station might depend on the type of worker you need at that time. And keep an eye on those first station bonuses. They come in very useful, so you want to try to build in the cities before the other players do. And remember, your milestone tiles might require you to build stations in certain places. And finally, at the end of the game, one of the performance tracks will give you bonus points for each station built. Since the game has Railroad in the title, it's only right that there is an action called Railroad. This action allows you to build new railroads across the country, expanding your network and connecting new cities, enabling you to build stations there later. To perform this action, you must take the leftmost two rails from your player board and place them onto two available rail spaces on the game board. An available space is one that connects to your existing rail network, including the cities that you are connected to, even if you haven't built a station there. For example, if you extend your railroad at the start of the game, you can extend out from Washington and Charlotte. Let's say I build my two rails here and here. I do not need a station in Little Rock to extend beyond the city. The cost to extend your network is $400, plus an additional $100 for each of these triangle icons in the spaces that you build in. 
This represents difficult terrain. You must place two rails, but they don't have to be next to each other. So you could, for example, place one here and then one here. This would cost a total of $900. The $400 base cost plus $500 because there are two icons here and three here. Each rail space may contain one rail per player, so there is no blocking anybody else's routes. Some rail spaces are marked with a deal icon. Each time a rail is placed in at least one of these spaces during a turn, then after you have completed your action, the current deal tile is resolved. I'll explain deals later on. You'll need to expand your rail network during the game in order to build in the other cities. And remember the milestones. Some of them need you to have built track in certain spaces, or to have connected a number of different cities. And also, at the end of the game, if you have progressed your performance marker up the right hand track, the level 5 cities that you are connected to will score you points. You might be wondering why there are telegraph offices in a railroad game. Well, back in the 19th century, the Western Union Telegraph Company worked closely with other railroad companies. And in this game, you can build telegraph offices for the Western Union in exchange for some of their shares. When you choose this action, take the leftmost building from your player board and place it on an available section of the telegraph line. This costs you nothing. An available section is simply one that does not currently contain one of your buildings. You can build in any of them, you don't have to build them in any order. However, at the end of the game, you will score the points shown between two sections if you have buildings in both of the adjacent sections. When you place a building in a section, you get the primary reward, which is always a certain number of shares. For the sections with the deal icon in them, this is shown at the top of the section, and for the others, it's shown in the bottom right. Similar to the first station bonuses, if you are the first player to build an office in that section, you place your building on the first office slot, and you take the bonus number of shares equal to the number shown here. So if I build an office here, I get four shares, one plus three. Then, regardless of whether you built the first office or not, you get to make use of the telegraph tile, which allows you to remove one of your workers permanently to receive the bonus printed on the tile. You can discard any of your workers from either your player board or your personal supply, and return it to the common supply. Remember that you must have at least four workers at the end of a turn. And also note that if you remove one of your non-specialised workers, you're optimising your workforce, because you only get your workers back once you've used them all. So by removing some of the white ones, it means you'll get the specialised workers back quicker. The bonuses for the telegraph tiles are all explained in the rulebook, and using the bonus of the tile does not remove that tile. It stays there for the whole game for everybody to use. Each telegraph section may have at most one office from each player. Two of the sections depict the deal icon. After your action is complete, if an office was placed in one of these two sections, the current deal tile is resolved, similar to placing a rail in one of the deal spaces. You'll want to build telegraph offices for a few reasons. First of all, they are the primary way of getting shares, and shares are really important. Also, the telegraph tiles. The abilities on them are very powerful, but you have to give up one of your workers to use them. Also, offices built in adjacent sections are worth points at the end of the game. And finally, the left hand performance track gives you extra points for each office you have built during the game. You've probably realised by now that you're going to need lots of money in this game, for building new stations and expanding your rail network. Luckily for you, the trade action allows you to sell off one of your company's assets to raise lots of money. The rails and buildings on your player board are grouped together into sections. When you choose this action, look at the leftmost section that still has a piece in it, and remove one of those pieces from the game to receive the money shown above the section. For example, if you choose the trade action at the very start of the game, you can sell either the rail or the building. If you sell the building, and then choose this action again next turn, you must now sell the rail. The money you get for selling something is shown above that section, and goes from $400 to $1000. Remember earlier on when I said that you must always take the leftmost pieces from your player board? Well, this is because of this action. Whenever you place a piece on the board, you are effectively increasing the worth of your company, and therefore when you sell something, you get more money. Also, this icon here tells you that before or after you sell, you may flip over one of your train tiles, which I'll explain next. You start the game with one of these train tiles. 
Any time during the game, when you perform an action or bonus with this icon, you may flip over one of your trains. You may not do it at any other time. If the train you choose to flip is face up, you get the ability printed on it and then flip it face down. Once flipped, the train tile does nothing, but on a later turn, if you're able to flip a train again, you could flip it back face up, which allows you once again to use its ability whenever you're able to flip a train. And any train tile face up at the end of the game is worth 8 points. So how do you get more trains? Well, there's a few ways. Each time you see this icon, you get to take a new train. For example, if you're the first player to build a station here, you may buy a new train tile for $300. You can have the same type of train more than once, and there's no limit to the number of trains you can have. The abilities of the train tiles is shown in the rulebook. I mentioned in the previous sections how deals can get triggered. When a rail is built in one of these spaces, or when a telegraph office is built in a section with one of these icons. The deal tiles represent entrepreneurs who are offering their services to carry out work on behalf of the railroad companies in exchange for shares of the Western Union. Two deals are offered, and after the active player has completed their action, they can take either none, one, or both of these deals. The deals are simply spend the shares shown on the left to get the reward printed on the right. After the active player has done their deals, all of the players in clockwise order get to do either the top or the bottom deal, but not both. Deals are the main use for your shares, which is why you want to be collecting shares during the game, because the deal tiles are really useful. You also want to be keeping an eye on when the next deal might be triggered, and if you want to use it, make sure you've got enough shares before that happens. You might also want to be keeping an eye on the shares that the other players have. If you have the opportunity, for example, to trigger a deal when the other players cannot use it, that might be a good tactic. After the deal tile is resolved, place it face down in a discard pile and turn the next deal face up. As mentioned earlier, when you use a specialised worker to perform an action, it makes that action better. Whatever colour you use, the main action must be performed in full. However, you then look at the sections below the main action to determine how that action is modified, based on the colour of the worker that you use. The orange worker, the accountant, usually lets you save money or gain money for actions. For example, using it to build a station allows you to not have to pay the amount of money indicated above the city tile. The turquoise worker, the engineer, allows you to repeat parts of the action or make them stronger. For example, if used on the railroad action, it allows you to place three rails instead of two. The grey worker, the negotiator, gives you various bonuses. For example, if you use one of them to build a telegraph office, you gain the first office bonus, even if you were not the first player to place an office there. And if you were the first to place an office there, you get the first office bonus twice. The purple worker, the foreman, grants you various benefits, often related to endgame scoring. For example, allowing you to move your markers up on the performance tracks. And what about the white worker? Well, remember that a worker of any colour may be used as if it was a non-specialised white one and the ability they give you, in addition to the main action, is always the same for each action as can be seen here. This is promoting, which means turning one of your workers into a manager and placing them onto a milestone. The worker you promote can even be the one that you've just placed. So, for example, I have this milestone and I want to promote one of my workers to place it here as a manager. But the only worker I have left in my supply is this one. I think he's called Nick. I could use Nick to perform this action for example, but then instead of getting the orange bonus shown here, just use it as if it was white and do this ability. Promoting him to become a manager, placing him on the milestone. Remember that once a worker has been promoted into a manager and placed on a milestone, it is removed from your pool, so you can only do so if you would still have at least four workers left at the end of a turn. That worker is no longer then yours, it stays on the milestone as a manager, and when the milestone's complete, you don't get the manager back, it's removed from the game and put back into the supply. During the game, certain actions and deals with this icon reward you with progress steps on the performance tracks. For each step you receive, you may move one of your marker tokens up one step on its track. If you receive multiple steps, you may split the points amongst several tracks. Moving a marker beyond certain places on the track means that you have to discard either money, shares or a worker. The positions of your markers define your points multipliers at the end of the game. 
For example, if your markers were here at the end of the game, you would score five points for each telegraph office you have, seven points for each station you've built, and 20 points for each level five city that you're connected to. The performance tracks allow you to specialize and focus on specific areas of the game. You might also want to watch where other players are advancing their markers, because that will give you some idea of the strategy that they're adopting. There isn't a fixed number of turns in this game. Everyone just keeps playing until one player has removed all wooden pieces from their player board to the left of their company logo. This triggers the end of the game, but it doesn't happen immediately. First, you keep playing until the end of the current round, so that all players have had the same number of turns. And then everybody gets one more turn. And then it's time to count up the points. Use the score pad to record everybody's points, which in order is points for the three performance tracks, points for completed milestones, face-up train tiles, and points for connected telegraph sections. The winner of the game is the one with the most points, and if the points are tied, then it's the player with the most money at the end of the game, with shares counting as $150. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play Railroad Revolution. If you want to see any more of my videos, please consider subscribing to my channel. Until next time, take care, and thanks for watching.